What is going on, everybody? It's the Phantom Wing here for a Monday Night Raw review for August this night, 2021. It is on the road to SummerSlam to a week from Saturday. Can you believe that this time next week we'll be in the go-home show to SummerSlam? It's just crazy to think that, yeah, a week from Saturday. Just crazy. Tonight was the return of Randy Orton for the first time in seven weeks. Would RKO, RK Bros be back to what they were doing beforehand? Or would they be going in a different direction? And basically, that's all you need to see about the show because the rest of the show was just bleh at best. So, Orton comes down, you can, he gets a big pop, and you just see this guy is enjoying. Because you remember, the last time we saw Randy Orton... They were still in the Yingling Center with a bunch of video screens. This is Orton's first match, first night. He doesn't have a match in the main event. But his first night in front of the crowd, and he soaks it in. Like, this is, like, this is Randy Orton. Randy Orton is out of character, making his way into the Amway Center, actually. They were actually back in the Amway Center, the original home of the Thunderdome. So, yeah, that is, they didn't, they didn't mention that either, which was really surprising. But he finally comes out and he says, this is why I'm supposed to welcome us all to Monday Night Raw. Out comes Matt Riddle. Uh, who says he missed Randy Orton. Riddle says now that Orton is back, they can team together again. Orton asks what in the hell makes Riddle think that he wants to team with, Riddle, team with him again. Only said they had some matches, some solid t some solid some t-shirts, got some buzz on social media, and that was it. He works better by himself, Wynton says, and he's been watching from home and saw Riddle has done just fine by himself. Actually, he hasn't. Also, and doesn't need he, he doesn't need my help. Wynton says they were a team, they were go they they were a good team, but it's time to move on. Here comes the tag team champions. Yes, at the beginning of the show, Randy Orton's like, RK Bro is done. We're done. Clearly, the match that we have all been predicting, even as this show ends tonight, the match that we're predicting, that people have been predicting, RK Bro versus TJ Styles and Omos, in my opinion, coming out of this show tonight, is still the match you're going to see at SummerSlam. We still got another week to go. So, I don't know what they're going to get to, but yeah. AJ says, this is so embarrassing, so much that you almost can taste it, and it just, it tastes a little too sweet. Ha ha ha, good one, AJ. They enter the ring, AJ goes on to ask Riddle on, on, about why Orton would team with him or be his best friend. He pokes at Riddle on having a broken heart, thanks to, thanks to him, thanks to Orton. Orton tells AJ to shut your mouth. He's been watching from home for seven weeks while AJ walks around the locker room like he's the man. He says, the only thing bigger than AJ's ego is that jackass right there pointing to Omos. OJ says that is crap and explains cap means it's a lie. Uh, AJ says, since Orton is a solo and has no tag team partner, why don't we do a fight tonight and see who runs Raw? Orton immediately accepts and says he's going to beat AJ with the three most dangerous letters, R, K, and O, oh, but... He goes for the RKO, AJ blocks it, gets out of the ring. Orton stalks Omos, but avoids, um, but goes for an RKO on him. That doesn't work. Then Riddle attempts an RKO and gets a chokeslam for his troubles. Rolls to the ring and uh, out of the ring, and Orton says, That wasn't a smart move. And he walks off as his music starts back up. So, it's just, it's just after everything that ends tonight, and we'll get to it in the main event. It feels like we're still on that track to RK Bro versus Omos and Randy or and AJ Styles at SummerSlam, where AJ and Omos will probably drop the tag team titles to RK Bro. It's just yes, if if you just look at the segment, it looks like Orton's done with Rant, with Matt Riddle, but there's still a full three hours to go. We see what happened last week with Drew McIntyre and Jinder Mahal. Kevin Patrick is backstage with, you guessed it. Nope, nope, you probably didn't guess this one. Baron Corbin. Why? I've seen enough Baron Corbin on SmackDown. I don't give a shit about Baron Corbin on SmackDown. So you 
have to bring Baron Corbin to Raw, which, okay, on Wrestling Reserve today, um, at 3 o'clock, Brian Alvarez and them had a collection of all the men, male athletes on Raw and SmackDown and AEW. Monday Night Raw has 35 before the night, 36 now, active wrestlers on the main, on their roster, 20 on SmackDown. Can you explain to me why Jinder Mahal couldn't bring anybody from Monday Night Raw? Pick a Viking Raider. Pick somebody else. I don't want to see Baron Corbin on Monday Night Raw. I get enough of him on SmackDown, and I can't stand the bullshit storyline there. He's here because of the brand, the brand Invitational, which, by the, by the way, is quarterly, so expect somebody from Raw on SmackDown this Friday. His life is bad, blah, blah, blah. Jinder called him, offered him a chance to turn his life around, says it's risk, risk, reward. He's running out of options, so if beating Drew will get him out of those financial troubles, so be it, sword or not. And he walks off. Corbin versus Drew McIntyre, which we've seen multiple times over the last two years. I don't want to see it again. They have match. Randy, um... Matt Riddle, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm messing names up here. Drew McIntyre gets a mic after he's getting ready to claim more the hell out of um, Barry Corbin. He's like, how much money do you need to get a couple, um, get, um, buy for a couple days? The guy says, a hundred million, a hundred thousand dollars. He's like, why not two or three hundred thousand for Drew McIntyre? He goes, three, two, one, kicks his head off. And that is that. Via Shanky and... Um, Jinder come down to try and take the sword, I guess. Drew grabs the sword, points it at them, and they all walk away. So, are we going to get a match at SummerSlam next Saturday? Where it's Randy, it's um, Drew McIntyre versus um, Jinder Mahal for, Jin, for Drew McIntyre's sword. Ugh, I don't even care. Is it going to be a ladder match with the sword hanging above the ring? And the person that gets, brings it down wins it in whatever. Honestly, I wish they just rid of the fucking sword anyway. It's not really Drew's. It's it's Vince McMahon's. He got it from Triple H and Stephanie. I was like, it was Triple H a couple years ago when they were in Ireland or something. Don't they see it on TV anymore. That gimmick should be gone. Riddle stops Randy backstage and asks if they can still be friends, even though Orton doesn't want to team up. Riddle mentions a t-shirt he had made and says he has an Orton scooter in the mail. Orton wants to be in Orton's corner. Um, Riddle wants to be in Orton's corner tonight. Orton just stares ahead and says, Riddle says, you can't be serious. Orton turns to Riddle and says, he is serious and don't call him me bro and walks off. So again, more on that later. Jeff Hardy versus Karrion Cross. This match is a rematch from three weeks ago when Karrion Cross lost in about a minute and a half by cheating. Now, the reason this match took three weeks to do is because Jeff Hardy got COVID. I don't know if he has the shot. Even if you have the shot, they want you to quarantine, blah, 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 a bunch of bullshit. I hope you enjoy your um your life as as a zombie. But anyway, so he came out, and I'm thinking, great, here we go. Because if he wouldn't have had COVID and wouldn't have missed that week, the rumor, the story going around is that Karrion Cross was going to lose again, and again, and again, and again. So I'm going in this match thinking, great, here comes Jeff Hardy to beat Karrion Cross again to further solidify NXT as being nothing. So, they have a match here. It goes about five minutes, I believe. But it's longer than the last match. And it looks like Co um, Co Jet Hardy's going to get the win early on with the Swanton. But no, Cannon Cross actually stops that. Cross blocked a whip and fights Hardy off. But Hardy nails a jawbreaker. Hardy rolls him up for a two count using a handful of tights. So, Hardy's cheating. Hardy's a babyface and he's cheating to try and win. Cross rocks Hardy and grabs him from behind on the second turnbuckle. Launches him in the mat with the big dude's day Sayota suplex. Goes right into the cross jacket to the mat. And that is that. So Cross, revenge on his match against Jeff Hardy. It's still, I do not care. 
that Je that Cross won tonight. I do not care that he beat Keith Lee two weeks ago. I do not care if he lost last week. You already the damage was already done. He could have beat Keith Lee two weeks in a row and won tonight. It wouldn't matter. This guy on his record is 50-50. He has lost to Hardy. He has lost to Keith Lee. He has also beat Hardy and beat Keith Lee. How is this guy supposed to look good being 50-50 on Monday Night Raw? It doesn't work like that. 50-50 just doesn't work because nobody looks good in the end. So... Class gets his championship, goes to leave, but goes back over to Hardy. Hits him with another doomsday, applies the cross jacket again. The referee finally gets crossed to break the hold after a few minutes. Stands tall and smirks as the crowd boos. So, again, he's 50-50 against Keith Lee and Jeff Hardy. So, expect the next two weeks to be matched against Keith Lee and Jeff Hardy so we can have a... Winner in both of those little contests and feuds and whatever. This is this this. They couldn't wait to bring Karrion Cross up until after he lost the NXT Championship at Takeover Thirty Six. They could have been doing coming soon vignettes between now and the night after SummerSlam, and then he makes his debut at the night after the night two nights after SummerSlam because SummerSlam's on a Saturday. Takeover 36 is on a Sunday. Who's watching Takeover anymore? Because that shit doesn't fucking matter. And then you have to cross make his debut. He doesn't have the NXT Championship more anymore. He has Scarlet with him. And he has the entrance. He has all the um, hoopla. But no. Karen Cross is just another meathead on Monday Night Raw. That is it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He is done as a character. He is dead. Nobody cares. Alexa Bliss versus Piper Niven because of everything that's happened between Eva Marie and Alexa Bliss. The story of this match is Alexa Bliss wins because the Lily, she brought Lily with her to the ring. She's in, she puts her brother in the ring post or under the turnbuckle, the, the bottom rope in one of the corners, the closest to the ropes. And during the match, towards the end of the match, Piper is dominating. They they show um, Lily up on the big screen. She winks. Piper Niven is distracted. Somehow Alexa Bliss is able to roll her up and get the pin in the win. Mm -mm -mm. This woman's division is dead. We see Matt Riddle, we see, um, we get a mock music video team, RK okay, Bro, Kevin Patrick stops Riddle backstage and asks that there is an end of their team. Riddle calls an emotional roller coaster. a somber Riddle says he doesn't know what to say or how to feel, but he has to respect Orton's wishes. He says he's a stallion and has to do what the stallions must do, and that's ride. He rides away in a scooter, we go back to the ring, and yeah, we go from there. We see how Damien and Priest defeated John Morrison last week. Then Priest and Ricochet defeated Morrison and Sheamus. Both wasted time matches. The Miz and John Morrison are backstage now venting about Priest. Sheamus appears and he can't stand the ridiculous catchphrases and outfits of the Miz and Morrison. Trust me, Sheamus. Nobody can. Sheamus blames them last week for the loss on Morrison. Sheamus and Morrison have words, but Miz calms things down. Sheamus goes on about how he's going to crush Ricochet tonight. Says Sheamus be uh, Morrison better get the job done against Priest tonight. Or he has... He's in, he's, he's in for a hell of a drought. Because he's America's moist wanted. I, I hate that thing completely. So, I guess every time a champion wrestles now it's a con in, in a non-title match, it's a contenders match. Because Damian Priest beat him in a championship contenders match. That automatically, if you're going to say it's a champion's contenders match... You go and give, the, and you say, "Well, that happened. You are the champion. You get the championship match on this date." Don't have another match where it's like, "Oh, Ricochet has a championship contenders match. If he beats Sheamus, then he gets a title match." It's fucking stupid. But of course, Sheamus won because Priest is going to be the one getting the title shot coming up at SummerSlam, or we should say Bummer Slam. 
Big bro kick after they um, climb Matt and Sheamus' match goes down. He follows up with a bro kick for the pin in the win. After the match, he stands tall. We go to replay. Sheamus poses now, raising the title in the air. Out comes Damian Priest. Priest does his entrance as Sheamus looks on. Priest goes to the crowd and hypes up the ring, enters the ring, getting in Sheamus' face. They have words and Sheamus backs away, exiting the ring to win a fan as the fans boo. Priest fires the bony air, but Sheamus tries to attack. Sheamus fans boo, and she, Priest blocks the attack, dumping Sheamus out of the ring. Out comes the clowns known as Miz and Morrison, as Damian Priest is going to take on those, t um, you know, his dude, John Morrison. So, we had the match here, and it was a fine match. Damian Priest hits the Reckoning, which I don't know when they stop calling it Hit the Lights, because I guess Reckoning, like... It, this just further shows you that why they had his move stop being called the Reckoning is because they gave Miriam that awful Reckoning name for a bit, and now that she's no longer Reckoning, hell, she's nowhere to be found. Yeah, that's... But yeah, it's the Reckoning again. He wins. And then after the match... Oh, what happened here was... After the match, he stands tall. He goes to the ringside as Miz backs up the uh, a wheelchair. He's pleading. Morrison tries to make the save, but gets dropped. Priest grabs a drip stick from Miz and sprays it at Morrison while he's down. He grabs another one, empties it on Morrison again, grabs Miz by the tie and taunts him. Miz jumps up out of his wheelchair, showing that he's not injured anymore. Priest stands tall in the ring and takes the mic, which, of course, they had Morrison shocked, of course, he starts running down Sheamus on the mic, but the United States Champion comes out on the stage telling Priest to say what he has to say when, he when he's in the room, not when he walks out. He calls him a bully and says every other bully in his life, he's dealt with it the same way, but this time it's different because he wants Sheamus at SummerSlam. Sheamus says Priest take a talks a big game, sure, says many, maybe he is a bully, and maybe he likes it, but he will put Priest in his place. He accepts and says Priest better get ready for the night of his life at Sh SummerSlam. Morrison tries to attack Priest, but he get, but gets leveled with a big bro, rogue like kick, and they have like Sheamus and Damian Priest have words, and that is that. So at SummerSlam, it's going to be Damian Priest versus Sheamus, which should really be a good match. If we haven't already seen it, how many times do we have? This is the problem with these championship contender matches. Why should I care about a big championship match? If the title, if the champion and the challenger have already faced each other, and the challenger beat the champion, nine times out of ten, if that happens, the champion is going to end up winning the title match. So it's kind of pointless. It is absolutely kind of pointless. T Bar and Mustafa Ali happened up next. Before that, we had Ali in the back with Mansoor as Mansoor. Presented him with a jacket that looks like his own. It looked very fancy, I should say. Very fancy. So, Mansoor had, like he said, you need to sit out there and just watch and learn. Watch and learn. Um, as I have this match. So, another meh match here. They bring it back in. T-Bar levels Ali with a big boot for a close two count. T-Bar ends up catching Ali in midair. Nailing a backbreaker for a close two count and Monsoor assist from ringside. Mace runs over and flattens him and says, you, That's what you get, boy. Snitches get snitches and all that shit. Ali counters T-Bar into a big roll-up for a two count. Ali with a big turn in a T DDT for the corner. Ali goes to the top, but he goes down and keep as the T-Bar kicks the ropes. T-Bar places Ali on the shoulder and delivers a modified GTS, which is also known as the Feast Your Eyes for the one, two, three. So, why are, they, why are these two a team? What? See, the whole idea behind this, in my opinion, is that, and I've heard other people say this probably too, is that you put these two together, you're going back to Saudi Arabia in October, if I'm correct, it's where they're going. You want to get these guys wins, momentum, going into Saudi Arabia where they would win the tag team titles. You beat him last week because Ali was in his hometown, and then you beat Ali this week. So why should I give a shit about this this supposed to be newly formed tag team if all they're going to do is lose after one week of being a winner? I don't get it. 
Timo stands tall as music Kate Mace joins him and they go for a double team on Ali for high justice, but Monsoor makes the save with the missile drop kick to Timo, sending him to the floor. Monsoor unloads on Mace now, dumping him to the apron. Mansoor kicks Mace to the floor, then Timo joins him. Mansoor helps Ali look and Ali looks shocked and how Mansoor cleared the ring by himself. He is the problem I don't get. You could have easily had Man, um, Ali win. Ali could have won the match and you still could have got the same result that you did. But they didn't. And they had him lose. Again. Uh, I, I just... Just, I don't get how WWE, like WWE just doesn't do things the smart way. It's real simple. It's real, real simple. But they just want to do everything the wrong way. Because they think it's the smart thing to do. It's, it's the right thing to do when absolutely it is not. It's just, if you want to get me, you want us to get behind this team, they need to win. Even if Mansoor, even if it's a singles match... They need to win. Mason Tebow are going to do absolutely fucking nothing. So why not just have them win? Why not just have them win? And then, only then, do you have Mace and Tebow, like, do you have Mace and Tebow attack? Because right on, quite honestly, they had no fucking reason to attack him. No reason to attack him. He they won. He won, and that was that. Just to make Mansoor look like he's a bigger guy, like a stronger guy than he actually is. That's the only reason I think they did that. But yeah, that's that's what WWE thinks. It's like, oh, let's let's have these like, and especially with the new edict of uh, no midgets or anything over thirty. Yeah, they're gonna destroy this company. It's just stupid. Anyway. We see Veggie doing his photo shoot backstage. Akira Tozawa appears as guys as the living man. He attacks Veggie and puts him, rolls him up. But uh, True stops that. Bunch of other stuff. Don't give a shit. Um, let's see here. Back from break, and the announcers congratulate Rock and John Cena as the most success, as the number one and two movies on the on in theaters right now. Again, don't really care. Kevin Patrick is backstage with AJ Styles and Omos. AJ goes about how Randy Orton made a cross a mistake tonight and confirm this for later tonight. We go back to the ring and out comes the champ Bobby Lashley and MVP as they hit power hits. The announcer cites some Hall of Famer. Oldberg versus Lashley and you could just tell. There are some people who are still fucking stupid chanting Oldberg. But there are a lot of piped in. A lot of piped in chants. Of course, back, if people didn't know, back in back in the day, in WCW, and Kevin Nash has confirmed this, they used to pipe in the crowd chants too. They wanted to make him seem like the biggest deal, which back then, yeah, you wouldn't want to pipe them in if, they're not, if you're not getting them. But now, just now, just now, nobody wants to see Bobby Lashley versus Oldberg. I think more people want to see Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar, not me. I really don't give a shit about that. But the sooner this is over, the better. So, yeah. Oh, my back is killing me. Say so yeah, between Lashley, Oldberg, and MVP last week, and Oldberg signing at ringside. Lashley hits the ring to pose and more. MVP calls the fans to rise and show proper respect to Lashley, but they boo. MVP addresses what happened last week and points to how if Oldberg really wants to fight, he didn't raise his hands when he got in the ring with Lashley, but he did come back like a coward and hit MVP in the rib with a rib-crushing spear. The safest spear I think anybody has hit in the last 20 years. I'm just going to say that right now. That spear did not look devastating at all. Like, that was, like, the slowest and safest spear, like... He would, he would give that type of um, spear to a Hulk Hogan or something like that because you're not going to sit there and, sp like, and spear Hulk Hogan as hard as you would, in, like, say, a Dolph Ziggler or something. Ow. Fuck. So, 
Yeah. He says he and Ashley are also fathers. He was not trying to threaten his son or anything. He was doing nothing like that. He was acting in a humanitarian capacity, telling Gage to talk to his dad out of the match. He loves him because last year is going to end his career at SummerSlam. He says he is slandered before, but he's not happy about Lashley being slandered. MVP has four bruised ribs and other cracked ribs because of the spear. And his x-rays are proven. He says the only thing worse than the spear from Oldberg is the one the Almighty MVP, the Almighty. He says Oldberg only has to blame for what, himself for what happens. And says maybe Oldberg shouldn't bring his son here. And then um, Lashley says he's just going to crush Oldberg at SummerSlam. And he is done. He's not next. He's done. And that is that. Again, I really could get, give two shits about this match. The sooner this match is over, the better, in my opinion. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Like, seriously, why should we care about Oldberg when he just had a match in January, lost in less than five minutes? So, why should I care? And then, oh boy! It's Nikki Trash versus Rhea Ripley because Charbonne and Ray and Nikki Trash have had back-to-back -back weeks match matches in the last two weeks, so Rhea Ripley has to get in on the fun. They have the match. Charbonne gets involved, destroys both women, double down, double disqualification, double um, DQ, and that is that. After break, we see a new vignette for the man formerly known as Elias as we see him walking outside somewhere with his car, guitar approaching a fire. We see video, various guitar shots. He's taken over the back from the superstars. He plays a brief tune and then tosses the guitar in and he says only this. WWE stood for a walk with Elias. But Elias is dead. He turns around and walks away into the darkness. What happens to the former Elias? I do not know. Maybe it's just a ploy. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Kevin Stars Randy Max saying is asked when he's distancing himself from, or from Riddle. Orton says it's simple. He works better alone. He does not need friendship. Le teammates, distractions to beat Orton. I mean, AJ, he's going to do that alone tonight all by himself. And he walks off. We go to the ring and out comes the main event. Andy Orton makes his way out there for a pop. Back from break and out comes AJ Styles with Omos. Of course, Omos is going to play a factor. Try to play a factor later in this match. Will it mean anything? So they have themselves a match. It's a really... It's a good match. I mean, it's two good... Two hell of a two guys. But Omos tries to get involved towards the end of the match. Riddle comes out of nowhere and tackle, attacks Omos, allowing... AJ is springboarding from the phenomenal forearm, but Orton catches it with the RKO out of nowhere. One, two, three, and Randy Orton beats AJ Styles. After the match, he stands tall in the middle of the ring. Riddle is in the ring now, wanting the hug from Orton. Fans cheer him on. Orton is hype, is not ha not having it. Riddle tells Orton to listen to the fans. They finally hug. The fans go wild. They ra he raises Orton's hand. And then Orton hits the RKO. He stands tall. He gets down. And he's just smiling. He's happy. And Byron Saxon says, I think they're back. I think they're back. So is it the dissolution of RK Bro? Or is this just a new chapter for these two to go? And you know Orton's been wanting to RKO Matt Riddle for months. For months. He's wanting to get this guy on an RKO. Let's see what happens. It's a shame that Orton just now came back and they didn't get at least a couple more weeks to build to this. But seriously, who else is going to, ta to challenge the Tag Team Champions at SummerSlam? I mean, they don't have to because this SummerSlam is going to go... It's got a hard, a hard end to it. So, like, say it has to end at 11 o'clock this around here, um, Eastern Central Time. Um, Eastern Time, then it's going to end at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So, yeah, that is your Monday Night Raw review. It is a show, it is what it is. There's not much else you can say about it, but hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like what is like this video, find me on Mines at the Frost Club, find me on Twitch.tv slash the Frost Club, find me on Instagram at the Frost Club, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday, um, Wednesday for 
AEW in Schittsburg. Until then, my name is Fonts, and I'll see you guys later.